our next speaker, who is Helen Hollyfield, and Helen will be talking about smallholder poultry diseases. Helen graduated in 1997 and worked in practice before working for APHA in varying roles, including as a veterinary investigation officer. She has an MSc in veterinary epidemiology and public health and joined Starcross as a VIO last year. Thank you, Caroline. So I'm going to talk about some of the common conditions affecting smallholder chickens that you might see in general practice. Uh, something useful to be aware of, as Harriet's already mentioned, are the disease surveillance dashboards. These show the surveillance information gathered from submissions to our diagnostic network, and these are updated each month. The menu on the left allows you to select a region, time period and age group of interest. And so you can see, for example, what the most common diagnoses have been in your local area. So this slide shows the avian dashboard and this shows data from non-commercial and small chicken flocks. So it's a useful one to be aware of. Generally, when chickens are presented, their clinical signs and history can be quite vague. They may just have lethargy, weight loss and egg drop, none of which necessarily offer an obvious diagnosis. So this talk will go through some of the common diagnoses that we see in chickens, but do please be mindful that avian influenza can look like any of these. AI causes increased mortality, which is often seen as sudden death without any clinical signs. So you really need to look at the flock picture to assess overall mortality. And this can be challenging in smallholder flocks where there might only be a few birds. If you suspect AI, you must report it. And um, there's a central number to call for England and Wales. There's a different process in Scotland. But if you look at the government's website, you'll get the most up to date number to call. And I'll talk a bit more about AI later. Egg peritonitis. This also includes salpingitis and impaction of the oviduct. And it's the most common cause of sporadic mortality in smallholder chickens. It generally affects older birds, particularly ex-battery hens, who are predisposed to the condition due to previous damage to the oviduct. It's usually the result of ascending infection from the vent, but it can also result from haematogenous spread from the air sacs, and affected birds ultimately succumb to an E. coli septicemia. A variety of stressors can trigger egg peritonitis, such as adverse weather conditions or the presence of predators. And systemic disease, vent pecking and obesity are also risk factors. The clinical signs are fairly non-specific, which is true of many of the conditions that affect poultry. And you may just see a dull fluffed up chicken that has stopped laying. Affected birds may have a swollen abdomen or they may just present as dead birds. And at post-mortem, typical findings are distension of the oviduct with inflammatory debris and egg material. And there's often an accompanying peritonitis with smelly contents in the peritoneal cavity. So in the top photo, you can see there's free egg material in the peritoneal cavity. Um, and there's also these fibrinous deposits over the bowel. You can see those. And the bottom picture shows this caseous material in, in the oviduct. Coccidiosis. Again, something we see frequently. This typically affects younger birds at around three to six weeks of age, but you can see cases in older birds if immunity has waned or it hasn't developed. There can be a range of clinical signs from ill thrift to dysentery. And you may notice affected birds have a bloody vent or diarrhea, or you might see wet litter in the poultry house. At post-mortem, there's thickening and dilation of the intestinal tract and hemorrhagic intestinal or cecal contents. The specific section of the intestine affected depends on which coccidial species is present, as they affect different levels of the gut. And even though the pathology might suggest a diagnosis of coccidiosis, the gross lesions are not diagnostic, so you need to do intestinal smears or take some sections of gut for histopathology. In live birds, you can do faecal smears or faecal oocyst counts. So this slide shows material from one of our post-mortems showing the anatomy of the gastrointestinal tract. We've got the muscular gizzard here, the duodenal loop with the pancreas in the middle, 
and these two blind ending CKI. In this case, there were hemorrhagic sequel cause, which is characteristic of Imeria tonella. Marix disease. Marix is caused by a herpes virus and it's highly contagious. All ages of chicken can be affected. It's spread by the respiratory route by inhaling infectious virus that's shed in the keratin layer of feather follicles. The virus is widespread in the environment and it survives for long periods of time. And Marix can present in various forms. The classical neural form is more common in backyard flocks and affected birds show typical signs of wing or leg paralysis, which is the result of peripheral nerve enlargement. In the acute form, tumors form in visceral organs, so affected birds may show signs of weight loss or anorexia, or they may just present as sudden deaths. Diagnosis is based on finding lesions at post-mortem, and then this is confirmed by histopathology. So this top photo, is of a bird with Marek's disease showing classical leg paralysis. And in the bottom photo, the red arrow is pointing to an enlarged sciatic nerve. You can see on the left here, this one is what a normal sciatic nerve looks like. And this one's obviously enlarged. Impaction. The crop gizzard and duodenum can all become impacted. And this is usually associated with ingesting long fibrous grass or vegetation straw bedding or bits of sacking material and the ingested material coils up and effectively forms a plug. Impaction is exacerbated in the absence of grit which is needed to aid the grinding function of the gizzard and we typically see impaction in free-ranging chickens when ranges are strimmed but the grass isn't collected up. Clinically affected birds may be weak and show weight loss or they may be found dead. Diagnosis is again at post-mortem where you find this very firm dry material and it's a good idea to try to identify what the material is so you can advise your client accordingly. So this photo shows an impacted gizzard with its dry fibrous content and including some long strands of grass. Here. Red mite, this is a common external parasite. It feeds by sucking blood, which it does mainly at night. The majority of the mite population live in the bird's environment and red mite can be a particular problem in birds housed in wooden sheds. You need to look in the dark cracks and crevices of the shed to find the mites and it can be helpful to use a torch for this. Newly hatched nymphs are small and pale because they've not yet fed. So these are the tiny specks in this top picture, these tiny little specks. And you can also find mites on birds. They are red, they're about 0.7 millimetres long. And if you look carefully, you'll see them moving. So in the bottom picture, you can see the red specks there on the skin between the feathers. Clinically, you see signs of anemia, so a pale comb and wattles. And you may notice that the birds are restless. Red mite can also present as mortalities if infestation is severe. So diagnosis is based on a supportive clinical picture and identifying the parasite. And at post-mortem, as well as looking for mites on the carcass, also check the crop for the telltale sign of ingested mites. Moving on to respiratory disease. Respiratory disease in chickens is often multifactorial and can be triggered by stress. Bacteria can be primary agents, but they're often secondary to mycoplasma or viral causes. Mycoplasma galliceptacum is one of the commonest agents involved and can cause persistent or recurrent respiratory disease in backyard flocks. Birds with mycoplasma typically have a swollen head. They may have infraorbital sinus swellings, ocular and nasal discharges, and they can produce these small bubbles from the eyes or the nostrils, like this bird in the picture. Flock morbidity is generally quite high and there is variable mortality. Mycoplasma is transmitted via infectious aerosols, contaminated feed and water and fomites, and it can also be transmitted vertically through the egg. I should also mention Mycoplasma synoviae, 
This tends to cause milder disease and synovitis, and it tends to act synergistically with other respiratory pathogens. At post-mortem, you might see swollen sinuses, and definitive diagnosis is made by a PCR DGGE test on conjunctival and tracheal swabs. And for this test, it's very important that you use plastic stem swabs, not wooden ones. Moving on to some viral causes, um, infectious laryngotracheitis. This is caused by herpes virus and it's usually introduced into a flock by asymptomatic carrier birds. Clinical signs range in severity from mild respiratory signs to peracute death. So in mild cases, you might see nasal or ocular discharge. And in severe disease, birds show signs of dyspnea, where the birds can be seen stretching their necks and gasping for air. And they can produce bloodstained mucus, which you might find on feathers or flicked onto the walls of the poultry house. ILT spreads relatively slowly through a flock over a period of days to weeks. And that's in contrast to infectious bronchitis, which spreads rapidly. At post-mortem, there are inflammatory and erosive lesions in the larynx and trachea. And you can find bloody mucus or cheesy deposits within the trachea. So here, bloody mucus in the trachea and cheesy deposits. Yeah. Definitive diagnosis is made on gross pathology and tracheal histology. Infectious bronchitis. This is caused by a coronavirus and there are many variants. IBED, IB spreads rapidly in a matter of hours and causes signs of coughing and dyspnea. Infection also causes a marked drop in egg production and adversely affects the egg quality. So the eggs that are produced are small, ridged and thin shelled and they have watery whites like the one shown in the picture where the yolk appears to be free floating. There's typically high morbidity and low mortality, and diagnosis is made by PCR on oropharyngeal and cloacal swabs. And again, for the PCR test, you need to use plastic stem swabs, not wooden ones. Uh, in commercial flocks, a live vaccine is used. So if the PCR result comes back positive, these are then sent for genotyping to assess the percent similarity to the vaccine strain and to get an indication of what strains of IB are circulating. Finally, avian influenza. Highly pathogenic AI causes high morbidity and high mortality in chickens. Infected birds may stop laying. They may have respiratory signs. There may be facial swelling, a cyanotic comb. There might be diarrhea, which could be green. And occasionally you see nervous signs of paralysis or tremor. But sudden death without clinical signs is a feature. These are photographs of AI infected birds. The photo on the top left shows the cyanosis and swelling of the face and wattles, giving this blue discoloration. The photo on the top right shows the purple discoloration of the legs due to subcutaneous hemorrhages. There are no pathognomic lesions for AI, and if birds have died suddenly, there may be no pathology. But at post mortem, you may find congestive and hemorrhagic lesions in the carcass. But if you suspect AI, you should be reporting it and not starting to do a post-mortem examination. I've included this photo at the bottom. This is from one of our pathologists and it's showing necrotic lesions of the pancreas. This is the pancreas here. And these little circles are the necrotic lesions. And this has been a feature in the recent outbreaks. So if you happen to do a post-mortem on a chicken and you see a pancreas that looks like that, then it's a big red flag and you must ring the APHA field service. Remember, you've, there's a legal obligation to report suspicion of notifiable disease and also remember that there's a potential zoonotic risk. So wear suitable protective clothing when handling sick birds. So to summarise, remember that common conditions occur commonly. Keep in mind that a post-mortem examination can aid your diagnosis. So be sure to know your bird anatomy and what normal looks like and use the expertise at your local VI centre, as Harriet said. VIOs are happy to discuss cases and can advise you on what samples to take. And we have specialist poultry pathologists at Last Wade who can help with challenging cases. 
You can send poultry carcasses to your local VI centre for a post-mortem. The cost to private vets uh, in June 2023 is £43.10, and that includes any lab tests, including histology, so it's really good value. And there's also a free carcass collection service for anyone over one hour's drive from a centre, and that includes poultry carcasses. And finally, I would like to thank my APHA colleagues for their input to the presentation and for the photographs that I've used.